Welcome to the 46th Writers' Week at UCR, 46 years of incredible literary presence. We at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kuwia, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many Indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Further, we offer acknowledgement to the Asian, Latino, and African American communities who have also built and tended to this city and its surroundings, oftentimes displaced and disenfranchised, despite their labor and commitment to the area. It is our third year online, and we couldn't be more thrilled than to offer captions and ASL interpreters throughout our sessions. And this year, we have some on-campus, in-person events for those close enough to attend. We hope that you attend many events this week and spread the news that we are presenting these 33 writers free of charge to all. Pre-registration for virtual events is required, so spread the links as you spread the news. All of the books are available through UCR, Barnes & Noble, and Cellar Door Books online. Please support our authors by buying their books. And following each reading, please stick around for our live Q&A session. With no further ado, we welcome and greatly appreciate everyone here attending this 46th UCR Writers Week Festival. All of our writers presenting, all of our volunteer panel moderators, ASL presenters, and everyone who tunes into these recordings in the post-festival virtual continuum, and to everyone here attending now, welcome to the 46th UCR Writers Week Festival. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Writers Week 2023. My name is Ebony O'Brien. I'm a first-year student in the MFA program here, and we'll be introducing some of the authors today. So this session features three amazing writers. We have Daniel H. Wilson, Clyde Derrick, and Kate Anger. So starting off, we have Daniel H. Wilson, who is a Cherokee citizen and author of the New York Times bestselling Robopocalypse and its sequel, Robogenesis, as well as How to Survive a Robot Op Uprising, The Clockwork Dynasty, and Amped. He earned a PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University, as well as, master as, well as a master's degree in machine learning and robotics. His latest novel is an authorized standalone sequel to Michael Crichton's classic The Andromeda Strain called The Andromeda Evolution. Wilson lives in Portland, Oregon. Please. Next up, we have Kate Anger. Her debut novel, The Shinery, was published by Bison Books University of Nebraska Press in the fall of 2022. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in journals such as Hit Mama, Faultline, Inlandia, and Cherry Tree. A double graduate of UC Riverside, yay, with a BA in theater and an MFA in creative writing and writing for performing arts, Kate taught playwriting at UCR for the past 17 years. Currently, Kate's working on her second book of historical fiction set in inland Southern California in the, in the summer of 1974. Next, we have Clyde Derrick. Clyde Derrick's novella, The Ghost Trio, won the 2020 Omnidon Fabulous Fiction Chapbook Novelette Contest, which is certainly a mouthful. His first novel, The Wash, won the Soul Books Fiction Prize for publication, while his story, Each One As She Must, placed third in UCLA's uh, Considering Gertrude Stein competition. His lauded short film, Strider's House, aired on PBS, and his plays, Angel's Flight and Tessaba, were produced on the Los Angeles stage by Wright Back Repertory Company. Clyde earned his BA at Pomona College, where he won the Dole King Kinney Prize for writing and an MFA in cinema at UC, USC. He lives in Claremont, California. Hey, so I'm Daniel H. Wilson, and today I'll be reading my short story, The Blue Afternoon That Lasted Forever, which was published in Guardian Angels and Other Monsters, a short story collection. The Blue Afternoon That Lasted Forever. It's late at night, my darling, and the stars are in the sky. That means 
And now I will lay you down and tuck you in nice and tight so you stay warm all night. This is our mantra. I think of it like the computer code I use to control deep space simulations in a laboratory. You recite the incantation <clears throat> and the desired program executes. I call this one bedtime. Marie holds her stuffed rabbit close in a chokehold. In the dim light, a garden of blonde hair grows over her pillow. She is three years old and smiling and she smells like baby soap. Her eyes are already closed. I love you, honey, I say. As a physicist, it bothers me that I find this acute feeling of love hard to identify. I'm a man who routinely deals in singularities and asymptotes. It seems like I should have the mathematical vocabulary to express these things. Reaching for her covers, I try to tuck Marie in. I stop when I feel her warm hands close on mine. Her brown eyes are black in the shadows. No, she says, I do it. I smile until it becomes a wince. This version of the bedtime routine is buckling around the edges, disintegrating like a heat shield on re-entry. I've grown to love tucking the covers up to my daughter's chin, feeling her cool, damp hair and the reassuring lump of her body safe in her big girl bed. Our current routine in its current incarnation has lasted one year, two months. Now it must change again. I hate change. Okay, I murmur, you're a big girl, you can do it. Clumsily and with both hands, she yanks the covers toward her face. She looks determined, proud to take over this task and exert her independence. Her behavior is consistent with normal child development according to the books I checked out in the library. Yet I cannot help but notice that this independence is a harbinger of constant, unsettling, saddening change. My baby is growing up. In the last year, her body weight has increased 16%. Her average sentence length has increased from seven to 10 words. She's memorized the planets, the primary constellations, and the colors of the visible spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. These small achievements indicate that my daughter is advanced for her age, but she isn't out of the record books or into child genius territory. She's just a pretty smart kid, which doesn't surprise me. Intelligence is highly heritable. I saw a shooting star, she says. Really, what's it made of, I ask. Rocks, she says. That's right. Make a wish, lucky girl, I imply, walking to the door. I pause there as long as I can. In the semi-darkness, a stuffed bear is looking at me from a shelf. It is a papa teddy bear hugging its baby. His arms are stitched around the baby's shoulders. He will never have to let go. Sweet dreams, I say. Good night, daddy, she says, and I close the door. The stars really are in Marie's bedroom. Two years ago, I purchased the most complex and accurate home planetarium system available. There were no American models. This one came from a Japanese company and it had to be shipped here to Austin, Texas by special order. I also purchased an international power adapter plug, a Japanese to English translation book, and a guide to the major constellations. I had a plan. Soon after the planetarium arrived, I installed it in my bedroom. Translating the Japanese instruction booklet as best I could, I calibrated the dedicated shooting star laser, inserted the disc that held a pattern for the Northern Hemisphere, and updated the current time and season. When I was finished, I went into the living room and tapped my then wife on the shoulder, our anniversary. My goal was to create a scenario in which we could gaze at the stars together every night before we went to sleep. I'm interested in astrophysics. She was interested in romantic gestures. It was my hypothesis that sleeping under the faux stars would satisfy both constraints. Unfortunately, I failed to recall that I wear glasses and my then wife wore contact lenses. For the next week, we spent our evenings blinking up at a fuzzy Gaussian shotgun spray of the Milky Way on our bedroom ceiling. Then she found the receipt for the purchase and became angry. I was ordered to return the planetarium and told that she would have rather had a new car. That didn't seem romantic to me, but then again, I'm not a domain expert. My thin translation book did not grant me the verbal fluency necessary to negotiate a return of the product to Japan. In response, my then wife told me to sell it on the internet or whatever. I chose to invoke the whatever clause. I wrapped the planetarium carefully in its original packaging and put it into the trunk of my car. After that, I stored it in the equipment room of my laboratory at work. Three months later, my then wife informed me that she was leaving. She had found a job in Dallas, and would try to visit Marie on the weekends, but no promises. I immediately realized that this news would require massive life recalibrations. This was upsetting. 
I told her as such, and my then wife said that I had the emotional capacity of a robot. I decided that the observation was not a compliment. However, I did not question how me being a robot might affect my ability to parent a one and a half year old. Contrary to her accusation, my cheeks were stinging with a sudden cold fear at the thought of losing my daughter. My then wife must have seen the question in the surface tension on my face because she answered it anyway. She said that what I lacked in emotion, I made up for in structure. She said that I was a terrible husband, but a good father. Then wife kissed Marie on the head and left me standing in the driveway with my daughter in my arms. Marie did not cry when her mother left because she lacked the cognitive capacity to comprehend what had happened. If she had known, I think she would have been upset. Instead, my baby only grinned as her mother drove away. And because Marie was in such good spirits, I slid her into her car seat and drove us both to my laboratory. Against all regulations, I brought her into my workspace. I dug through the equipment stores until I found the forbidden item. And that night, I gave my daughter the stars. The cafeteria where I work plays the news during lunch. The television is muted, but I watch it anyway. My plastic fork is halfway to my mouth when I see the eyewitness video accompanying the latest breaking news story. After that, I'm not very aware of what's happening except that I am running. I don't do that very much, run. In some professions, you can be called into action in an emergency. A vacationing doctor treats the victim of an accident. An off-duty pilot heads up to the cockpit to land the plane. I am not in one of those professions. I spend my days crafting supercomputer simulations so that we can understand astronomical phenomena that happened billions of years ago. This is why I'm running alone. There are perhaps a dozen people in the world who could comprehend the images that have just been shown on television. My colleagues, fellow astrophysicists at research institutions scattered around the globe. I hope they find their families in time. The television caption said that an unexplained astronomical event has occurred, and I know better than that. I am running hard because of it, my voice making a whimpering sound in the back of my throat. I scramble into my car and grip the hot steering wheel and press the accelerator to the floor. The rest of the city is still behaving normally as I weave through traffic. That won't last for long, but I'm thankful to have these few moments to slip away home. My daughter will need me. There's a nanny who watches Marie during the day. The nanny has brown hair and she's five feet, four inches tall. She does not have a scientific mindset, but she is an artist in her spare time. When Marie was 10 months old and had memorized all of her body parts, including the phalanges, I became excited about the possibilities. I gave the nanny a sheet of facts that I had compiled about the states of matter for Marie to memorize. I intentionally left off the Clark, the quark gluon plasma state and Bose-Einstein condensate and neutron degenerate matter because I wanted to save the fun stuff for later. After three days, I found the sheet of paper in the recycling bin. I was a little upset. Perez in the cubicle next to me said the nanny had done me a favor. He said Marie has plenty of time to learn about those things. She needs to dream and imagine, and I don't know, finger paint. It is probably sound advice. Then again, Perez's son is five years old and at the department picnic, the boy could not tell me how many miles it is to the troposphere, and he says he wants to be an astronaut. Good luck, kid. Oh yes, running. My brain required 400 milliseconds to process the visual information coming from the cafeteria television, 80 milliseconds for my nervous system to respond to the command to move, a two minute sprint to the parking lot, then an eight minute drive to reach home. Whatever happens will occur in the next 30 minutes and so there is no use in warning the others. Here's what happened. An hour and 38 minutes ago, the sky blushed red as an anomaly streaked over the Gulf of Mexico. Bystanders described it as a smear of sky and clouds, a kind of glowing reddish blur. NASA reported that it perturbed the orbital paths of all man-made satellites, including the International Space Station. It triggered tsunamis along the equator and dragged a plume of atmosphere a thousand miles into the vacuum of space. The air dispersed in low pressure, but trace amounts of water vapor froze into ice droplets. On the southern horizon, I can now see a fading river of diamonds stretching into space. I don't know the moon in the sky. I don't see the I don't see the moon in the sky, but that doesn't mean it isn't there necessarily. All of this happened within the space of 30 seconds. This is not an unexplained astronomical event. The anomaly had no dust trail, it was not radar detectable, and it caused a tsunami. Oh, and it turned the sky red. Light does funny things in extreme gravity situations. When a high mass object approaches, every photon of light that reaches our eyes 
must claw its way out of a powerful gravity well. Light travels at a constant speed, so instead of slowing down, the photon sacrifices energy. Its wavelength drops down the visible spectrum. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Red shifting. I am running because the only, only one thing could red shift our sky that much and leave us alive to wonder why our mobile phones don't work. What passed by has to have been a previously theoretical class of black hole with a relatively small planet-sized mass compressed into a singularity potentially as small as a pinprick. Some postulate that these entities are starving black holes that have crossed intergalactic space and shrunk over the billions of years with nothing to feed on. Another theory, possibly complementary, is that they are random crumbs tossed away during the violence of the Big Bang. Perez in the next cubicle said I should call them black marbles, which is inaccurate on several fronts. In my papers, I chose instead to call them pinprick-sized black holes. Although Perez and I disagreed on the issue of nomenclature, our research efforts brought consensus on one calculation, that the phenomenon would always travel in clusters. Where there is one, more will follow. Tornado sirens begin to wail as I careen through my suburban neighborhood the woman on the car radio just frantically reported that something has happened to Mars. The planet crust is shattered. Astronomers are describing a large part of the planet's mass as simply missing. What's left behind is a cloud of expanding dirt and rapidly cooling magma, slowly drifting out of orbit and spreading into an elliptical arc. She doesn't say it out loud, but it's dawning on her. We're next. People are standing in their yards now on the sidewalks and grass, eyes aimed upward, the sky is darkening. The wind outside the car window is whispering to itself as it gathers occasionally into a thin, reedy scream. A tidal pull of extreme gravity must be doing odd things to our weather patterns. If I had a pen and paper, I could probably work it out. I slam on the brakes in my driveway to avoid hitting the nanny. She's standing barefoot, holding a half-empty sippy cup of milk, chin pointed at the sky. Stepping out of the car, I see my first pinprick-sized black hole. It's a reddish dot, about half the intensity of the sun, wrapped in a halo of glowing superheated air. It isn't visibly moving, so I can't estimate its trajectory. On the southern horizon, the crystallized plume of atmosphere caused by the previous near miss still dissipates. It really is beautiful. What is it, asked the nanny. Physics, I say, going around the car and opening my trunk. You should go home immediately. I pull out a pair of old jumper cables and stride across the driveway. Marie is standing just inside the house, her face a pale flash behind the glass storm door. Inside, I lift my daughter off the floor. She wraps her legs around my hip, and now I am running again, toys crunching under my feet, my daughter's long hair tickling my forearm. The nanny has put it into a braid. I never learned how to do that. Depending on the trajectory of the incoming mass, I may not ever have the chance. What did you do today? I asked Marie. Played, she says. Trying not to pant, I crack a few windows in the house. Air pressure fluctuations are a certainty. I hope that we only have to worry about broken glass. There is no basement to hide in here, just a cookie cutter house built on a flat slab of concrete. But the sewer main is embedded deep into the foundation. In the worst case, it will be the last thing to go. I head to the bathroom. Wait here for just a second, I say, setting Marie down in the hallway. Stepping into the small bathroom, I wind up and violently kick the wall behind the toilet until the drywall collapses. Dropping to my knees, I claw out chunks of the drywall until I've exposed the main sewer line that runs behind the toilet. It's a solid steel pipe, maybe six inches in diameter. With shaking hands, I shove the jumper cable around it. Then I wedge myself between the toilet and the outside wall and sit down on the cold tile floor, the jumper cables under my armpits, anchoring me to the ground. This is the safest place I can find. If the black hole falling towards us misses the planet, even by a few thousand miles, we may survive. If it's a direct hit, we'll share the fate of Mars. At the sonic horizon, sound won't be able to escape from it. At the event horizon, neither will light. But before that, we'll reach a Lagrange point. As the anomaly cancels out Earth's gravity, we will fall into the sky and be swallowed by that dark star. The anomaly was never detected, so it must have come from intergalactic space. The Oort cloud is around a light year out, mostly made of comets. The Kuiper asteroid belt is on the edge of the solar system. Neither region had enough density to make the black hole visible. I wonder what we were doing when it entered our solar system. 
Was I teaching Marie the names of dead planets? Daddy, asks Marie. She's standing in the bathroom doorway, eyes wide. Outside, a car engine revs as someone speeds past our house. A distant, untended door slams idiotically in the breeze. Marie's flowery dress shivers and flutters over her scratched knees in the restless calm. Come here, honey, I say, in my most reassuring voice. Come sit on my lap. Hesitantly, she walks over to me. The half-open window above us is a glowing red rectangle. It whistles quietly as air is pulled through the house. I tie the greasy jumper cable cord in a painfully tight knot around my chest. I can't risk crushing her lungs, so I only wrap my arms around Marie. Her arms fall naturally around my neck, hugging tight. Her breath is warm against my cheek. Hold on to your daddy very tight, I say. Do you understand? But why, she asks. Because I don't want to lose you, I say. And suddenly, my, and my sudden swallowed tears are salty in the back of my throat. Whips are cracking in the distance now. I hear a scream, screams. A gust of wind shatters the bathroom window. I cradle Marie closer as the shards of glass are sucked out of the window frame. A last straggler rattles in place like a loose tooth. The whip cracks are emanating from loose objects that have accelerated upward past the speed of sound. The crack, crack, crack sound is thousands of sonic booms. They almost drown out the frightened cries of people who are falling into the sky. Millions must be dying this way. Billions. What is that? Asks Marie, voice wavering. It's nothing, honey. It's okay. I say, holding her to me. Her arms are rubber bands tight around my neck. The roof shingles are rustling gently, leaping into the sky like a flock of pigeons. I can't see them, but it occurs to me that the direction they travel will be along the thing's incoming trajectory. I watch that rattling piece of glass that's been left behind in the window frame, my lips pressed together. It jitters and finally takes flight straight up, a fatal trajectory, a through and through. What's happening, Marie asks through tears. It's the stars, honey, I say. The stars are falling. It's the most accurate explanation I can offer. Why, she asks. Look at daddy, I say. I feel a, subtle, a sudden lightness, a gentle tug pulling us upward. I lean against the cables to make sure they're still tight. Please look at your daddy. It will be okay. Hold on tight. Nails screech as a part of the roof frame curls away and disappears. Marie is biting her lips to keep her mouth closed and nodding as tears course over her cheeks. I have not consulted the child development books, but I think she's very brave for three years old. Only three trips around the sun, and now the sun is going to end. Soul will be teased apart in 100,000 mile licks of flame. My darling, I say, can you tell me the name of the planet that we live on? Earth. And what is the planet with the ring around it? Saturn. What are the rings made of? Mountains of ice. Maybe a sense of wonder is also a heritable trait. Are the stars? Something big crashes outside. The wind is shrieking now in a new way. The upper atmosphere has formed into a vortex of supersonic air molecules. Daddy, screams Marie. Her lips are bright and bitten. Tear ducts polished, those, polishing those familiar brown eyes with saline. A quivering frown is dimpling her chin, and all I can think of is how small she is compared to all this. Honey, it's okay. I've got you. Are the stars very big or very small? Very big, she says, crying outright now. I rock her as we speak, holding her to my chest. The cables are tightening, and a sewer main is a hard knuckle against my spine. Marie's static charged hair is lifting in the fitful wind. You're right again. They look small, but they're very big. The stars are so very, very big. A subsonic groan rumbles through the frame of the house. Through the missing roof, I can see that trees and telephone poles and cars are tumbling silently into the red eye overhead. Their sound isn't fast enough to escape. The air in here is chilling as it thins, but I can feel heat radiating down from that hungry orb. Minutes now, maybe seconds. Daddy, Marie asks. Her lips and eyes are tinged blue as her light passes me. I'm trying to smile for her, but my lips have gone spastic. Tears are leaking out of my eyes, crawling over my temples and dripping up into the sky. The broken walls of the house are dancing. A strange light is flowing in the quiet. The world is made of change. People arrive and people leave, but my love for her is constant. It's a feeling that cannot be quantified because it is not a number. Love is a pattern in the chaos. It is very late, my darling, I say. 
and the stars are in the sky. They are so very big. And that means it's time for me to give you a kiss and a bunny kiss. She leans up for the kiss by habit, her tiny nose mushing into mine. And now I can't do this. And now I will lay you down. Swallow your fear. You are a good father. Have courage and tuck you in nice and tight so that you stay warm all night. The house has gone away from us and I did not notice. The sun is a sapphire eye on the horizon. It lays gentle blue shadows over a scoured wasteland and a red star still falls. Good night, my darling. I hold her tight as we rise together into the blackness. The view around us expands impossibly and the world outside speeds up in a trick of relativity. A chaotic mass of dust hurdles past and disappears. In our last moment together, we face a silent black curtain of space studded with infinite unwavering pinpricks of light. We will always have the stars. And that's the blue afternoon that lasted forever. Uh, thank you for listening. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. I am really excited to be here. I have been a fan of Writers Week since I was an undergraduate, um, coming to events and being inspired and moved and buying a lot of books. So I uh, I hope that um, you find this interesting. I am here to read an excerpt from my debut novel, The Shinnery. And before I do that, I'd like to give you a little bit of context that I think will be helpful. Um, it's based on a true family story, or I shouldn't say based, I should say inspired by. Um, it's an event that I learned about on a genealogy trip to West Texas about 20 years ago. And I became so intrigued with this story that I learned that my great great grandfather had been on trial for killing a man. And this was something that was kind of shocking. And my own grandmother, who lived to be 93, never even heard this story. That's how it had been buried. But it was alive in newspaper archives. And so that's how um, our distant cousin had discovered it. And the thing that really gripped me was the, the how of it. So he killed the young man, and the, the story is to protect his young 17-year-old daughter, uh, who becomes Jessa in the novel. And so it, it just was, I found it a really compelling question as to the how of it all. And it stayed with me. And then finally, I did what we writers do. I, I got to it. And to try to understand what it was about, I started writing. And that's how, that's how we got here. Just a, just a blink and a book appears, because that's how publishing works. Um, if you have questions about that, we can talk. I'm going to start with a prologue, which prologues can be a little controversial. Some people don't like them, but um, I had an intention, which uh, I, hopefully you see. And so I have the prologues. And then something else I'm going to read you is a newspaper excerpt. So much of the story I can't know, everyone's dead, and it was a secret, but um, I used the newspapers to ground the story in what was the actual events, the reality of it, and the timeline of it, I used that. So um, they're just kind of sprinkled throughout. And then I will move uh, and read a little bit of chapter one, and Oops, looking at my time, which I don't see my time, um, I might have a little bit more reading time for another uh, event. So we will see as it unfolds. Um, you need to know it's set in the 1890s in West Texas, which is the prairie, uh, very undeveloped, it takes place in the town um, of Rainer, which is now a ghost town. And you'll meet the character of Jessa. There's made mention of Papa. And then in the scene um, that I'm going to be reading from, it's a mention of her sister, um, Nellie, her younger sister. All right. So here we go with the prologue. <clears throat> March, 1895. Jessa stood at the edge of the shinnery. The grasses, which in spring would hide the shinnok, were dormant for winter. The thicket looked shaggy, its acorns long buried. 
She considered the animals burrowed for winter among the shrubs' roots, how they could suspend their lives until early spring. She wished to join them, tunnel into the earth, only she'd stay a bit longer, July, by her calculation, if she wasn't sent away entirely. What else would they do with a girl like her? Her body had healed from the beating, no sign of the bruises she'd worn for over a month. Yellow-brown splotches, the color of brackish water. It was cold on the prairie, and she was glad for it. Her nose ran and her cheeks burned, and this mild suffering brought her comfort. She pulled her shawl off her shoulders and let it dangle on the ground. Red had followed her out here, but the dog had since waded into the acres and acres of brush on his own his head bobbing in and out of sight. Below her, in the distance, Jessa could see her father putting out salt for the cows. He would walk back to the barn soon, and she would join him there. Speak the words she never could have imagined speaking. Maybe such things were better delivered in pieces, like swallowing mother's bitter teas, only sufferable in sips. She couldn't worry about whether she would say it wrong. She knew she would. Haskell Free Press, March 16th, 1895. Killing in Rainer. Parties who came from Stonewall County Thursday evening for a coffin reported the killing of a young man. The killing was done with a shotgun. And while no particulars could be learned, it was said to have been on account of some family trouble. So here's chapter one, I'll read the excerpt. It starts in the morning and uh, Papa has come from town and Jessa thinks he's bringing the seed and they're getting started on this new project and she's really excited about it. And um, instead he's come home without the seed and he's come home with what he says is the news. So this is a little bit later in the house. And then I'm going to skip and then continue. All right. With the family all gathered in their small kitchen, Papa delivered his news. His hands were folded in front of him, resting on his belly as if he were making a speech in church. You'll be settled with the Martins, he said to Jessa, the ones that got the mercantile. Settled, she didn't understand. A mother's helper. What, she said. No such thing had ever been discussed before. It was as wild to her as if he'd come home saying, I've added a wife, or we're trading the horses for elephants. Papa explained she'd board with the Martins and come home to visit. Everything she knew about the world seemed to flip. Visit home? Home was the place you left to go visiting. What on earth had happened to Papa when he went to town? She was Papa's right-hand man. He had called her that despite her sex and had been since she stopped schooling four years earlier when she'd turned 13. Her two younger sisters could not begin to take her place. It made no sense for her to leave. She objected in the way she could in measured tones as if panic weren't overtaking her. She wasn't quick with words like her sisters. Feelings and ideas would get stuck on the other side of her voice, no words to carry them across. Or she'd start talking and her words would fail, trail off, evaporate, everyone staring at her waiting. Papa wasn't in a waiting mood. He seemed uncomfortable, brushing dust that wasn't there from his britches. It's an opportunity, Jessa. She detected something false in her father's voice and wished the two of them could talk outside. She wanted so much to take his hand and pull him out the door, but the thought itself embarrassed her. She had to act like a woman grown if she was to secure a say in this. Skip, skip. Papa cleared his throat. You're of an age, Jessa. An age where I can work hard here, you need me. I can use you, but I don't need you. Her cheeks went flush, 
tingled as if she'd been slapped. It made her want to argue. He was half crippled, lead from Chickamauga still lodged in his thigh, half a dozen other war injuries, and now arthritis working to turn his hands useless. She'd caught glimpses of him in bed, Mama wrapping his hands in warm willow bark poultices. He damn well did need her. See a bit more of the world, he said. Nellie laughed, but quickly clamped her hand to her mouth. Rainer, 10 miles as the crow flies, hardly qualified as the world. Her sister gave her a look that said, what on God's green earth is he talking about? It didn't make sense and until it suddenly did. Of an age meant marriageable. He must have wanted her to meet people. Now he was barking at a knot. Jessa didn't want a husband. Most took you away from everything you loved. Sister Minta was a half day's ride away in Aspermont, and Sister Joe several days in Albany, a distance of several days. They hadn't seen Joe in almost two years, and the last time they did, she'd cried in the kitchen after her husband snapped at her for an overdone roast. Jasper was as jolly as a guy as you could meet, but his mood shifted like summer weather. When he was in a foul one, you felt that same prickly air as before a rainstorm, everyone trying to figure out where the lightning would land. Only Sister Maggie had stayed close. She found her husband, Solon Scott, when he came to the shinnery to inquire about grazing rights. The marriage was a love match. As a man with six daughters and no son left to help, Papa was as excited as Maggie about the pairing. Still, no thank you. I don't wish to marry if that's what you're thinking. You're getting ahead of yourself, talking about work, looking after children, seeing a little something. You don't want to confine yourself. But she did. She had assumed every year would roll out similarly to the last. And it had given her a deeply peaceful feeling, knowing that in spring they'd calve and plant, in summer harvest and preserve, plan and repair in the fall, and prune and make do in the winter. Many families had a daughter that stayed, looked after her parents. And though no one had ever said it, she was that daughter. The shinnery was hers. She'd marry it. Dear shin oak and prairie chicken, ornery cow and morning sun, I take thee gladly. All right. So I have a little bit more time, I believe. When Jessa goes to the Martins, uh, it doesn't go great. Uh, these are not her skills. These are not her people. Um, and the only sort of light is a little bit the children, especially the youngest one, but also their piano teacher that comes to the house. Um, twice a week. His name is Will Keys, and he becomes an ally of hers. So this is from chapter four. She is um, walking um, to the mercantile um, with the little boys, and it's the mercantile that Mr. Martin, her boss, owns. Uh, you will hear mention of Matthew and Gabriel, the little boys that are with her. And I'm just going to read a little bit. I think it gives context to how she feels in town and all this newness all around her and the rules for being in town and navigating this world she doesn't know much about. So here we go. <clears throat> Jess across to the other side of the store. There were shovels and hoes and implements she could not name, but what they had in common were their unspoiled surfaces. She had never seen a tool completely free of rust and dirt before. Never considered a tool's beginning point, unblemished, clean. The store was such an assembly of shiny and new. Implements, bolts of fabric, harnesses, feeders, serving wear. Jessa wished she could take something home for Mama. Something fanciful that couldn't be shared. A man appeared in the doorway of the store. The sun was so bright outside that he appeared as a shadow man on the threshold. Jessa felt inexplicable dread, the same lurch in her chest she felt when a hawk flew over the chicken yard. Though she didn't think she'd ever seen him before, he looked familiar, six foot if he was an inch, 
lean, long golden brown hair like burnt sugar, and dimples like Will's, but not as pronounced. Could this be the brother, she wondered? The maybe brother? Well, he sized her up and down, nose to tail, like she was a horse. Afternoon, miss, he said. He was missing two teeth, his canine and the one next to it. It tarnished his looks, and for some reason, Jessa was glad for it. On his hip, he wore a forty-five six shooter, and he walked as if ready for a gunfight in the mercantile. Papa would not approve. Guns were a fact of life on the frontier, and her father always carried one while traveling and ranging. But this was different. Cock of the walk, her papa might have called this fellow. For young men to only have to travel from hand to hip to settle differences, real or imagined, was a danger. All right, I'm going to end there. Thank you. Hello, I'm Clyde Garrick, and I will be reading two excerpts from my novella, The Ghost Trio. A love story, an historical story, and a ghost story, mostly told by Laurel, who shares her unusual life narrative, starting with childhood experiences and a mysterious red-headed man. I had the most typically normal life a girl could have in the 1950s and 60s, growing up in the most placid town in America with the dearest and most benign family. Only I was not part of this pattern. I overheard my mother and father talking one day when I was eight years old, in the third grade. They thought no one could hear them, and my father expressed the concern that Laurel seems detached. My mother said with an ice cube in her voice that the girl seems, and then she jumped into the word, haunted. That made me smile and feel special, which I don't think was their intention. And looking back, I was absolutely haunted. It always felt to me, even as a young child, that my life at that time was not the beginning of something new that everyone thought it was. I knew that something else had come before, and at some point I would return to that something else, whatever it had been, if only to visit. We weren't a religious family, but like most such families, we turned to the nearest available minister in a crisis when our inner resources failed us and we had no quick answers. I'd seen the inside of the Lutheran church for only a few baptisms, including my own, but I knew Pastor Litka from his own children at school and felt very much at ease with him. My mother brought me to see him one day after school, and he offered me a few cookies on a lamb-shaped plate and a glass of milk. It was just Pastor Litka and me and the stale air of his office. We talked about school and hobbies, and whether or not I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I figured the answer to that had to be yes, to avoid a lecture. At some point, I saw that the red-headed man was sitting in the room, not with us exactly, but in a wingback chair to the side. I had seen him a number of times before. Once, when my parents were having a barbecue, he had come through the back gate and blended easily into the gathering. No one said hello or noticed him, and... Uh, but he came to where I was swinging on the swing set and pushed me in the swing very hard and far too high. My mother shrieked and one of the men quickly placed himself to catch me when the swing swooped back. I was giggling about my moment of danger and how it stopped the party, even though it scared me as well. When my mother came to scold me at how high I had gone, I told her that the redheaded man had given me an extra hard push. But there was no red-headed man anywhere to be seen. The guests looked among themselves and laughed at the impossibility of a crop of red hair among us. I didn't laugh because I knew more than they did. I had also seen the red-headed man when I was alone in an aisle in the supermarket. He appeared to be studying the different cereals, then looked at me very meaningfully and tipped his hat. My mother called me and again he was gone. I also saw him twice walking home when I had stayed after school for piano lessons, and no one was on the street going home, except him and me. He always kept a distance and then would turn or disappear when an adult came along. The red-headed man was a nice-looking man, always in a black suit that seemed to be a little small and uncomfortable. 
a white shirt with a collar that was confining, and a black hat. I assumed that he lived somewhere in town and was harmless, and that our meetings were accidental. But now that he was here in the office with the minister and me, I thought that perhaps he was Pastor Licka's friend, or worked with the church. Of course, that explained his suit. Maybe he was a religious man, too. Your mother tells me that you have a special friend, Pastor Litka said, without looking at me directly. I knew that adults only looked away when something made them uneasy. I thought he meant my friend, Julie Fletcher, and started to describe her, but Pastor Litka interrupted me. No, Laurel, I mean the red-headed man. Isn't there a red-headed man that you consider a friend? I looked to the red-headed man sitting just behind the pastor. He smiled and put his finger to his lips as if to say, this is our secret. I remember working my lower lip with my teeth, trying to figure out what to say next. I sensed that if I told Pastor Litka about the red-headed man, I would be in some kind of trouble, and I could hear my mother being hysterical, as she was sometimes about things that didn't matter. So I told the pastor that the red-headed man was an imaginary friend. Pastor Litka really was a kind man. He wasn't looking to shame anyone and understood children, having four of his own. He smiled and asked me to tell him about my imaginary friend. I made up a few wonderful characteristics to portray the redheaded man as a protector, looking out for me when I was alone. I wanted my mother to feel that I was safe and being watched out for. The pastor nodded, and in five minutes, he believed he had convinced me to look to Jesus Christ for protection instead. I went along with that, all the time remembering my father talking about religion as hogwash on bright Sunday mornings. My mother was light and cheerful that night, spooning out her gluey tuna noodle and frozen pea casserole. And I figured that the pastor had reassured her that there was nothing exceptional about me. Meanwhile, I had learned that the redheaded man was my special secret not to share with anyone or I'd have to spend an hour with Pastor Litka again, when I would rather be home reading Nancy Drew. The red-headed man visited me several times a year up through childhood. Once it was while I was getting into my clothes for school, about 17, and I turned and found him sitting at my desk, and his eyes went up and down my body. I cried out in alarm, and he turned to nothing, like he'd stepped into a narrow slit in reality. I'd overheard girls talking in the locker room saying that being Catholic was more powerful than being Protestant because you could call on a saint or the Virgin Mary to protect you. I knew there was a convent in town and it had a gift shop and all kinds of religious paraphernalia. I mentioned to the nun behind the cash register that I had a friend who was Catholic who believed that she was being watched by an evil spirit. The nun clearly relished this sort of conversation and took 20 minutes to make several recommendations, embellishing the colorful histories of the saints. I put the St. Benedict Medal on once the church was out of sight. It did not see the red-headed man again until I was 22 years old, and supposedly on my way to Spain, uncharacteristically, and had forgotten the medal in my haste. As a young woman, On her trip, Laurel is drawn to the city of Prague. This is the 1960s. And there she learns that in a past life, she was Annalisa, the lover and wife of the Czech composer Domek Svoboda, the red-headed man who has always haunted her and wants her to join him in the afterlife, meaning, of course, she would need to die. A very unwilling Laurel partners with a resident ghost hunter and scholar named Alec, and Dusha, Annalisa's former maidservant, to exorcise Damik's spirit from the house in which they once lived. Here she is repeatedly drawn into the past by a loving spirit who continues to put her life into danger. I slept in a chaise for an hour or so, my head senseless, then awoke to hear people outside, down on the stone terrace. I found the voices irritating until I recognized one than a few. Without thinking to alert anyone, I went downstairs. There was a table I had not seen before on the terrace, and about 12 people around it, talking in low voices. 
Nothing seems celebratory, and even the zither that someone strummed like brightness or energy. I was in a new dress, a summer dress, violet, plain spun, with folk designs embroidered at the hem, and I could feel a healthy cascade of my hair on my shoulders. Well, I'm not leaving, one of the men said, and I knew that this was dear, dear Carol, Carol Chapek, sitting next to his brother Joseph. The two of them had written a startling play about robots that Dominic and I had loved called R-U-R. In fact, the word robot had come from out of the play. I knew instantly that Dominic and I loved both of the brothers, but were worried about Carl's uncertain health. Carl's brother, Joseph, nodded. The brothers Chapek will remain in Czechoslovakia, he declared. German occupation or not? What difference does it make, really? A fashionable, bored woman said, leaning on a man I did not recognize. The Habsburgs only left us 20 years ago. Germans here have always thought they owned the country, forced us to speak their language. Someone muttered something more pointedly unpleasant about Germans, and a familiar man's voice reproached them. Please remember, my wife is German. It was Dominic speaking at the head of the table. Yes, I am 100% German biologically, I said in perfect Czech, taking a glass of wine that I knew was mine. German was the first language I learned. I have only German relatives on either side for generations, but I was born in the Sudetenland. I live in Prague. My husband is Czech, my daughter is Czech, and I am Czech. My friends cheered and I looked across the table to see Dominic smiling, a huge cigar between his flashing teeth. His face was red from the alcohol and the sun, and I'd never felt so much love coming from one person before. We stared at each other, and I wanted so much to be right with him. Then I remembered our guests and told them, and you, my friends, are the great writers and composers and artists of this stately, this precious land of ours. And you have spoken out against the capitalists and the dictators, the fascists, and suppression. And every one of you is marked. Their voices rose in a slow murmur, reluctant, skeptical, and I shot back. There is someone long, a dear friend to me, who is in a place of authority to know all this. Yes, a German, and I'm sorry to report also. He recently took a government post. He's confided in me that each one of you especially is endangered as you represent the true power of the Czech people. You, Pavel, being a Jew, and you too, Victor, you are both essentially especially in danger, get out of the country now. A few started to object or dismiss me, but more were listening, thinking as I continued, get out now before you're taken away. It's already happening in Germany, don't give them what they want. And is what, what is most precious to you, your lives. I saw them all listless or digging in their heels and I said very firmly, all of us can be in Italy, in a day and a half Switzerland in two, we don't even need to pack. Someone made a remark about needing at least a few karuni to subsist. And I shot back, I can help you. You know I would not do otherwise. They all faded from me in the way my memories now came and went. And eerily, I knew the fate of each one. Carl Chapek spared the fate of a concentration camp by dying on Christmas Day, 1938. His brother Joseph, dead at Bergen-Belsen, April 1945. And Victor Ullmann and Pavel Haas, both dead at Auschwitz, October 1944. Only a sullen stooped Domix Svoboda, composer of a jazz opera predicting the Nazi terror and demeaning Hitler, was left at the table, his cigar a mound of ashes on a saucer. I knew his end also. Death by suicide, August 1938. Velasquez with my sister, Dami, I heard myself saying, but we were no more on the terrace on a summer day among friends for the last time. As if one dream was exchanged for another, I was walking into Dominic's music room on the third floor, where he was denying the world at a keyboard with music composition paper and pencils, cigars, and becherovka. We have to leave as soon as possible, Dami, I said firmly. I've packed your bag. I have the tickets. I've done everything to save your life, in short. You mean you and your lover have done everything, Dominic snorted. I was impatient with him. Gunther and I knew each other before we could talk. And then I realized 
This was our last argument, the concern about the Germans. The lunch that proceeded to the sense of things ending unhappily, this is what I had to turn around, or I would be repeating it as Laurel. This realization nearly came too late as Demick was already backing me onto the open balcony three stories above the stone terrace. He spat a frustrating string of words, a contraction of all his insecurities. The son of a prostitute, being Czech and not German, how he had taken my charity. Backing against the balustrade, I could hear, smell the cigar still on his breath and see my reflection in his opaque eyes. And I suddenly knew I was going to die here helplessly. Hi, uh, and thank you so much, Clyde and Kate and Daniel, and to all of you in the audience. I'm Tom Lutz, and I'm sitting in for Ebony O'Brien, who had an equipment fail. So um, I'm afraid you have to settle for second best here. <laughs> I'm going to do what I can to uh, to uh, ask ask the questions. Uh, for those of you who have a question but haven't asked it yet, please do uh, use the little over on the right side of your screen, the little quote box that has a question mark in it. If you click on that, it'll uh, it'll allow you to ask a, a question. Um, and I'm going to start with a couple of things that are, I think, more um, prompts than they are questions, uh, even though there was a little question at the end of them. But the first is, um, uh, it, Daniel, your, your Andromeda Evolution is a sequel to a book that you didn't write. This is not the, the piece that you read for us today, but it's, a, it's another book of yours. Uh, and there's a school of criticism that says that that is what we are all doing as writers all the time. That is, we're writing in relation to all the books we've read, and thank God, because we don't want to have to invent science fiction. We want to just use it, right? We don't want to invent yeah. a ghost story or historical fiction. We just want to tell the story. Does that ring true to you? Did you find that it was different to write the the sequel well, uh, than it was is to write other things? Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. You always are writing within the context of the world and everything that's going on. There's no way to avoid that. You know, with my other novels like Robo Pockups, I'm writing a book knowing that everybody in the world thinks robots are evil. You know, that's like the assumption. And so you go into that just sort of knowing what the expectations are for genre or for whatever. But the difference in writing a Crichton novel is there are millions of Crichton fans that you can potentially uh, really piss off. You know, so luckily it went really well. But uh, to to write a sequel to someone else's work is definitely very different because um, you know, you, you want to carve out some ownership of your of your own sort of for your own ego and your own style and, and everything like that. And also you want to honor the legacy of, of somebody who wrote a lot of really great books and a lot of really great entertainment. And, and you want to live up to that. So, um, you know, another really interesting aspect of that is I was working with the Crichton estate. And so um, mm -hmm. Michael Crichton passed away in 2008. And, you know, when you think of Michael Crichton, you think of just kind of a name, right? This is some really famous writer. He did all the Jurassic Park stuff. He did all these amazing things. He was also a guy, you know, he's a guy with a wife and a child. And, um, and this is all very personal and very real for them. And so I found that it was actually more, uh, more difficult and, and more of a sort of uh, just a job for me to make sure that I was honoring Michael Crichton to his own family. Uh, as opposed to this sort of wider world, uh, this because he just exists in the pop culture context of the world because he's carved out so much space in it. So it was a really interesting challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, I mean, everyone seemed to enjoy the book. It did well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was ultimately, it was a really great experience. And I'm so glad that it, it turned out the way it did. Mm. And yeah, I mean, that's uh, Harold Bloom calls it the anxiety of influence, right? But this is the, a, a, a different kind of anxiety of influence um, when you're when you're actually thinking about him as a real person, obviously, with a, with a real family and real um, fans. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. and I think, you know, ultimately, that's what really gives um, gives your work its heart and its emotional core is that it's coming from a real person with real feelings. And when I'm in life and doing anything and I... Uh, and feeling big feelings, I think, okay, think about this, because this is what writing is. This is where all all the science fiction, all the robots, all the spaceships, that's all ancillary to the feelings, the big emotions that are that are at the heart of that. And so 
Um, you know, I think that's why when you read something from somebody, you really get a peek at who they are and, and what they're thinking about and, and um, you know, what's really going on with them. And uh, it, just to get ahead of the question, yes, I have a daughter. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. uh, while I am not, um, while I am not quite as literal minded as the character I was reading, um, you know, I, I have been a scientist in the past, although, and I have interacted with lots of people who are very mathematically minded. Um, mm -hmm. So that was not exactly me, but uh, certainly I, um, I was inspired with uh, the blue afternoon that lasted forever to, um, to really build on that relationship with my daughter and those big emotions. Yeah, which is why it's so heartbreaking and wonderful. I know. I wish I could have found a way to keep him alive in the end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't happening. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're still with us. Um, and and uh, Kate, uh, uh, it's kind of same same prompt. Uh, did you feel the kind of uh, weight of the long history of the historical novel on your shoulders as you wrote it? You're, you're uh, there now. I felt the weight of the secret. And uh, when it was told to my aunt who was doing a genealogy book, it was like, don't write it in, in your genealogy book. And she wrote about my grandfather's trial, this little sentence, nothing about this great, great aunt. And I don't, the man had been dead that told us the story, but this is West Texas Church of Christ. And they, there seemed to be this sense of shame still attached to it. So I was a little bit nervous about that about using the real names. And I had an aunt that was constantly like kind of hovering, um, and which was so strange. Now I think about it, it feels so ridiculous, um, especially because I've met these distant cousins, this, the sons and daughters of the man who told us the secret. And they're like all aboard, they're all about it. They're really excited to have this family history, but guess what? They didn't even know it. Their dad never told them. And they have the archives of the family history with it in it, never looked at it. So, um, mm. Uh, that was that was pretty cool, but it was like trying to deal with because there's they're real people, but there's so much you can't know. Um, I just wanted to be respectful, especially to the people that uh, are dead in the story that that my family says were terrible, horrible people. Mm. I don't get their side. There's nobody to speak for them, so um, that was a little tricky. They didn't which use is, their real names, which is your you took as your job to speak for them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I, you know, I still have a bias. We pick a side, right? In terms of like the crime and how, and how that comes out. So, mm. yeah. And I, you know, I had the newspapers to look back on. So I felt like it was pretty credible, but it, and this, I know all fiction writers find this like stuff that you sort of make up later, you find mm. like precedents for it. Like, yeah. I don't know how she got out of the town. I was like mother's helper. And later within my own family, ancestors who I had records and letters of people that had done that. Um, mm. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. And, and Clyde, um, maybe you could speak to this as well, although um, uh, you might want to answer Melina's question as well um, about what inspired the ghostly romance and the otherworldly connect connections. Um, in her um, I, I grew up in a family that, that was, you know, mixed heritage, but, but one of those heritages, uh, was Celtic. And so um, ghosts were part of everyday life. That the supernatural, it was that there was a thin veil between what we experience and what other people experience. And and so that that had always enchanted me. Um, and and um, uh, more, more to answer the other prompt, after mm -hmm. I had finished this book, after it had been accepted by a publisher, I remember that when I was 21 years old, one summer night, I read Aura by Carlos Fuentes, and it had left an impression on me, and so I reread it, and darn if it didn't influence the writing of this book. I hadn't looked at that book, and I won't say how many years, but it's you know been more than 21 years, and um, it it's it's something you can read in one sitting, and it's it deals with um, cultures that have vanished um, through change, and and that was very powerful to me to realize that a book that I had read many years later had really been influential on me and, and had, you know, no pun intended, haunted me and never really left my consciousness. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of sh shocked that I haven't written, uh, written a book about the black, a black stallion. Since that <laughs> <laughs> That's the book that, that I fell in love with reading, reading. Um, 
Well, I love Little House on the Prairie, and I feel like I, I am continuing Little House on the Prairie as you're researching and you're in that world. So yeah. <laughs> grown up version. Yeah. And, you know, I am um, as a I, you know, I started my life as a scholar, as a literary scholar. Um, and so I I this this next question, like the like the last one, next prompt is comes out of this kind of my relation to literary criticism, the kind of history of literary criticism. Um, and so, and part of my studies were about American realism, which is both a kind of genre and just a period, you know, the period from the Civil War to World War II or something like that. Um, but literary realism is a, is a thing, naturalism, ver versions of realism. Uh, in the meantime, and, and I was always a sucker for, for that, for realism. And I assume that Daniel, you were always kind of a sucker for science fiction, right? And, uh, and I, you know, for, for supernatural stories of various kinds, right? So, um, but they all—it's it, the more I try to do the philosophy of these forms, the more they seem to me to all be doing the same thing. Um, and you've all kind of spoken to it a little bit um, already, but isn't isn't the historical novel simply another way to talk about? The reality we're in right now isn't the ghost story simply another way to talk about the reality uh, you could add future to history there as well i mean <laughs> yeah whether you're predicting the future or looking at it the historical but uh, go ahead and if i can answer that as well yeah um, when, when the publishers were were talking to me at, at omni dawn about writing a description of the book i had left out the uh, the, the social content, you know, the setting, the, the pre-World War II setting and, and the peril that the Jews were facing. And they said, what about that? And, and they felt that that was fair. This was prior to Ukraine and what, mm -hmm. what's happening there now. And now it's even more timely. I had never intended that. That just kind of happened. Yeah, I mean, so to, to this kind of, I think, goes back to the first question that you asked, which is just kind of like writing within the context of what's going on, is that of the world, you know, and not being able to get around that is, I think a lot of times, you're with science fiction especially, because you've already seen the same genre being used to establish, to sort of tell the same stories over and over, changing over the years, a lot of times you write around that. You're literally trying to find new ways to, to use that context to tell, to deliver new messages, right? And and so um, I find myself a lot of times, you know, you tend to write the stuff that you're in love with, right? I, I mean, at some point, if you're a writer, you read something and you said, I want to do that, right? Like, could I ever possibly do that? And so once you've read so much of, of the kind of stuff that you love, you naturally want to innovate. You want to find some new way to tell that story. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's a lot of what happens is you naturally not only do you have that all up there in the hopper, like in your brain, you also are finding your way through that routing through that path with all the knowledge of what was there already. Um, it's kind of funny because like I, I write screenplays as well and, and I'll show up um, and I'll see a story and I'm like, well, haven't I already seen this like a thousand times? And then you ask the person like, do you read science fiction? You know, not just watch the movie and it's like, well, you know, I, I love science fiction. I haven't really read it. And you're like, well, I'm going to give you five books to read. <laughs> and then I want you to come back and like, uh, and, and, you know, find a way to tell this story again. Um, mm -hmm. And so just, I don't know, having that love there and having that, which definitely motivates you to really experience the different types of, of, uh, of books and movies and comics or whatever it is that you love. Um, you know, it ends up informing your writing in, in, a, in a good way. It lets you, you know, find something new and complex, and to, a new way to tell a story. And and maybe that's a, a good 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 way to lead lead me into my my final question, which is um, there are a lot of people listening to us now who um, are either beginning writers or thinking about writing. Um, uh, and and so my question is, what's what's your advice to them? Obviously, Daniel, part of that advice is read some books. Um, I think is what what we just heard. But um, Kate, do you want to you want to start us off? What what's 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 your advice to young writers? So or for writers, whatever their ages. Yeah, it, 
For me, I think reading is the number one like uh, ground for learning about writing and really thinking about not just like this pleasure reading, but then stopping and going, how did they do that? Looking at the the construction of it. Um, you know, sometimes I would do outlines of books I really love to see how they work. But for me, it's community. It's people that, you know, you don't need to go and get an MFA, but it's for me, I need friends. And I have uh, my novel, I don't think would have come about without a community of people that were, were reading. I did it's not even like deep criticism at some points. It's just like someone wants to see your pages. And I really, I, I think sharing pages and having a community of writers um, invaluable to me personally. Great. And Clyde? Uh, I started by writing in Hollywood or not writing in Hollywood or writing but not getting paid in Hollywood for uh, a number of years. And, and I kept writing outside of myself to just get a foothold. And what I would say to any writer is write, write what you love. Don't, don't think about a marketplace. Don't think about what people want to see because what's genuine is going to be gripping more than anything else. Great, thanks. And Daniel, last words? Uh, I would say you gotta trust your brain, man. Like, you know, it's like tempting to feel like you're, you know, sitting in front of a computer, you're getting up on a tightrope, you're gonna do something amazing. And that is not, in my experience, what writing is about. I mean, you sit there, I, when I'm starting out on a project, I'll just turn the screen completely off. And I think of it as, cause I don't want anybody, if I'm in a coffee shop, I don't want anybody to see the horrible dribble that's like going <laughs> into my computer from my brain and, and be judged for it, right? But I think of that process as like putting clay on a wheel, right? You're just throwing stuff on there, man. You can't worry about it. And you know, the real skill I think of writing is not, you know, is not actually getting it on the page. It's like knowing when to stop. Right? It's like knowing when what to take out is more important than knowing sort of what to put in. So um, I would say trust your brain because it is amazing how later on in a novel, and Kate was saying something about this, later on in a novel, later on in the process, you'll go back and start to see things that are all coming together. Like your subconscious was somehow at work, right? You're, the pattern all starts to make sense and you start to put that together. And it, it's just incredible how much of that stuff will be there if you just trust yourself to write and write and write. And, and to add to Clyde's uh, advice, you know, one thing when you're growing up, especially whenever you're young and you're growing up, I think a lot of times it can feel like you have a very boring experience like you're normal everybody's you know the same like you know it's not your experience is gonna be pretty similar to the other people that you're around because you're all coming up like on the same block in the same city and in reality that you are not boring your experience is unique and interesting to someone else once you get far enough away in time or geographically or whatever it is because i just find so many young people think that they don't have anything to write about and um or that they need to, like Clyde was talking about, step outside and find something more interesting. And no, 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 you are what's interesting. The stuff you love, the stuff that's part of your life, just trust yourself, throw it all down, <laughs> and you'll get something you know, sooner or later. So that's been my perspective, and, and that's kind of how it's worked out for me in my career. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so much, Clyde. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much. This is this was just great. And we and I really appreciate you all taking taking part. We'll we'll meet back here at one o'clock tomorrow for uh, session three. And um, and hopefully we won't have any computer glitches this next time. But uh, thanks again to everybody that that came to listen. And uh, and thanks very much to our three writers. Uh, let's give them a big round of applause which they won't hear, but they'll feel it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much and, and see you tomorrow.